Welcome to Psych Health and Safety in Canada. And today on the podcast, I have Dr. Dan Bilsker. And Dan was one of the original um, developers of Guarding Minds at Work and uh, uh, is a clinician himself. And I will turn it over to Dan to really introduce himself to you. Okay. Well, the word psychological health and safety, that term, uh, the derivation was actually kind of interesting for us. We had a group of people, gosh, was it 10 years ago, uh, working on developing a survey that would be useful for organizations that wanted to look at how they were addressing or preventing or taking action in their organization in regard to preventing mental health problems and issues, et cetera. And the question of how do we describe this thing that we're addressing came up. Now, the term psychological safety, psychological health, these concepts were around. And there was a direct analogy to occupational health and safety, which has focused for the last hundred years on physical health and physical safety. We said, well, we're drawing the analogy. We're going to move now and talk about psychological health and safety. It was a bit of a debate back and forth. What's the, the, the appropriate term? I think we settled on a really good one because it calls into that tradition of occupational health and safety. Every organization has an OHNS committee. They know about guaranteeing the physical safety of their workers. They know about doing things that will help to maximize the physical health of their employees. All these organizations have gotten it. And it's taken a long time for this to sink into the culture of organizations as something organizations don't argue about, they don't resist it, they all get it. That is part of the responsibility of an organization, it's part of what makes an organization work well. Here we are saying, you know, there's also this psychological aspect. Your employees also have mental health questions and issues. You can help them to be psychologically stronger, you can help to keep them psychologically safer in the same way that you had processes to keep them physically safe. This has been, I think in many ways, a revolutionary concept. It's been a new way of thinking about the workplace and about what the employer can do. I think in the past, anything that was mental health, psychological in nature was perceived as private, something that workers would deal with on their own. The employer really had nothing to do with that. That was just out of scope. But the employer, along with the employee, would bear the impact. When something went wrong, when a worker became overwhelmed or traumatized or depressed or in some way just psychologically overly distressed, it would impact their work, their ability to demonstrate their capacity. It would affect the workplace, the organization, the employer at all levels. This would have a very significant and sometimes very dramatic impact on what was happening in the workplace. So for an employer to say, well, that's just none of my business, hasn't really turned out to be true or very effective. When employers have begun to take a sense of responsibility and of efficacy for taking action around helping their employees to be more safe, to be more healthy in the psychological side of things, there's a real win-win kind of outcome here, a general benefit for the employee, for their well-being, and for the workplace, and its stake in having the employees be maximally effective. So I, I think it really is a mutual win situation. I believe it's worked out well. It's still in its relatively early stages within the Canadian employment workplace sector, but I think we're starting to see some very positive impacts. Dan, I remember years ago you saying that employers would say, oh, you're not managing, you go see a therapist. But you talked about, they went to the therapist and they talked about their family, they talked about their feelings, they didn't talk about the workplace stressors much, they didn't talk about those things. And I remember you saying, we need to help therapists to understand the value in addressing workplace issues. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. Many, many theories of psychotherapy have been developed over the years, but they haven't tended to be focused on your occupational function. 
that's been seen as outside the scope of what therapy does or relatively peripheral. What you really need to do is explore your childhood, identify traumas and so forth. And then somehow workplace stuff, functional stuff like that will, will take care of itself. But by bringing the workplace and the struggles and the challenges of your working life right into the therapy room, you gain a great deal of power and you're often focusing on issues that in fact are primary, are central to what's happening. So in my practice, and as it turns out, a high proportion of my clients come right from the insurance industry. They're people who are off work on psychological related disability. But by focusing in on what's happening at work, what the challenges were, what the stresses were, often in conjunction with what's happening in your personal life, you get those stresses building up together you gain a lot of powerful understanding of what's happening for someone, what's critical. And then by working with someone to help them recover so they can maximize both their competence at work and their joy in working. And a lot of people derive a lot of satisfaction, a lot of sense of meaning in their lives from what they do in their work. And by enabling them to get over those barriers that are disrupting their work function, it's not just that they give more to the company. It's not just that they're able to hold a job which pays them a salary. It's beyond that. They're able to engage in the workplace in a way that reflects their sense of value, their sense of meaning, their goals, which gives them a great sense of meaning in their lives. And most of us do look to our work as one critical source of the meaning in our lives. And so, including that in therapy, I think is critical. Yeah, I remember you saying too that because it can be a quick win for somebody to deal with those work issues, it also makes them um, more able to engage in the rest of the therapy. But you brought up something else that I thought was really interesting and it's about meaning at work. And I remember Dan talking to a, a room full of, um, union stewards and they said well not everybody's going to find meaning in their work and uh, they gave an example that they said you know well like a janitor they're just cleaning up other people's dirt they're never going to find meaning I responded to that but I'd love to hear your response to that one of those sources of meaning is the fact that you're doing a tough job and you're doing it in a careful manner you're doing it in a conscientious manner, and you may be helping to support a family, for example. You're giving something. You're doing a hard job so that the people you love can have a home, can have education, can have food. And to say that that's not meaningful, I think, misses the point. So yeah. even if the work itself is not highly stimulating and a great deal of fun, it's often many jobs are really hard and jobs are really dangerous. And I've talked in some worked in some of my research on issues of men's mental health, where, you know, 80 percent of serious injuries are, are male. Uh, Ninety seven percent of workplace deaths are men. They do these difficult and dangerous jobs and they do that out of a sense of honor, of responsibility to their partners, to their families. And this has been a tradition for a long time. And to say that that's not meaningful really misses so many points. It is so meaningful for so many people. I am doing a tough job, a dangerous job, a difficult one. It's hard to do. I'm taking it on. I'm doing it for myself, but really most of all, I'm doing it for the people I love. So Dan, you bring up a another fascinating point for me is, um, for people doing dangerous jobs, how do how does their mental health at work uh, reduce injuries and illnesses? Well, you know, recently been involved in a in a several year project working with paramedics. Now, there's a job with a fair degree of physical risk in it injuries, all kinds of occupational problems that can arise, but also psychological risks and dangers. And again, we 
talk briefly about, about meaning and moral injury is a term that's often used. So if you're working in a field like that, where you really believe in what you're doing, you believe in being helpful, it's very challenging and can be quite risky, and you've taken it on, but you find that you're under-resourced and you see outcomes going sideways. You see bad things happening that weren't what you intended simply because you don't have the time, you don't have the support, and you're working so hard to get these results, it can be heartbreaking. It can be moral injury in that it violates your value and your goals in doing that work. That can be very hard to live with. You have a sense of why you're doing the work, the kind of good outcomes you're looking for, what you're expecting of yourself. And then for reasons beyond your control, you're not able to hit those outcomes, bad things happen. You can feel like a failure. You can feel like you're not fulfilling your goals. You haven't done well enough. You can blame yourself. And that can be psychologically devastating. So that's the kind of injury that can happen that is psychological in nature, but it can have a huge impact on an individual, can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder, can lead to depression and despair and a sense of cynicism, which can burn people out pretty fast. Yeah, absolutely. And then when we look at being in that state, whether it's the state of burnout, the state of disappointment, frustration, whatever, and we talk about physical safety, can you talk a little bit about the connection between being present um, in your work or being distracted by all these other things? And, and I certainly can see a connection that there are a number of jobs that have a fair degree of, say, physical risk that require really careful focus, that require diligent attention, that require a systematic, methodical approach to what you're doing, thinking about all the possible outcomes and so forth. And if you are in that state of cynical burnout, of discouragement, of depression, it can be very hard to focus. And it certainly can increase your risk of physical harm. So you want people to be motivated, to be committed, to feel recognized for what they do, et cetera. So they're able to fully apply themselves, their attention, their thoughtfulness, their methodical nature to, to the job. And that makes them physically and psychologically safer. Mm -hmm. Now in, in the work that you're doing um, with clients, what do you find are the things that um, are turning points for them where they can take a bad situation in the workplace, put it into perspective so that they can move forward in their lives? Okay. I often work with a set of tools and approaches called cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's proven in research to be the most effective overall the most effective kind of treatment for psychological disorders or conditions, depression, anxiety, and so forth. It's an approach that is very practical. It's focused very much on the present, on the situations you face, on the challenges you're facing. And it does, uh, a, a, it teaches a set of skills that are critical. One of them is called cognitive restructuring, where you often ask people in that situation that was very difficult, what were you thinking? What were you saying to yourself? How were you interpreting that situation? And it's remarkable how often people will say, I blame myself for that outcome. I felt that I had really blown it. Clearly I should have done better, even though I lacked resources and the risks were out of my control, but I still felt that it's my fault. I've really blown it. I should have done better. And then people will they'll label themselves, what a fool I was to have done that, what a loser I am to keep not working out in these situations. They will magnify the nature of the situation. They'd say, this was a total failure. I completely blew it. Uh, I really can't do this work anymore. I'm useless. They'll say terrible things within their own heads. No one else can hear that. No one else will ever learn that. But in their own heads, they're talking to themselves in manner that is harsh and brutal and unfair. And what we do in CBT, one of those skills is, let's bring that out. Let's write it down. 
So you know the emotional response you had to that situation. But do you know that before you had that emotional response, you interpreted the situation in a certain way, which then gave rise to the emotional response. You felt absolutely discouraged and sad. Before that, you were saying to yourself, I've totally blown this. This is an utter failure. Frankly, I failed at everything. This is who I am. Those statements to yourself gave rise to that unrealistic negative emotion. Let's take a look at those thoughts. How realistic is that statement to yourself? I have failed at everything. Does that really fit the evidence you've got from your life? Is that magnification? Are you overstating this? Is that what we call all or nothing thinking? What would a more realistic and helpful way be to talk to yourself? Would you say that to a friend in the same situation? And so often people will say, well, of course not. That would be so discouraging and so harsh. That would be such an unfair judgment. I would never lay that on a friend. I said, but you'll do it to yourself. Why? Let's challenge it. Let's come up with a better one. We want your self-statements, your interpretations to be fair, realistic, and helpful. Those are the three magic qualities of good inner thinking, good self-talk, good interpretation. They help you to move forward in the most fair and well-balanced way. And they give rise to emotions that are more realistic and more fair. And they then open up much more adaptive behavior, better problem solving, better outcomes. So helping people to identify their patterns that they get caught up in that are so demoralizing and painful to challenge them, to come up with an alternative way of coping that leads to much better feeling and much better outcomes is one of the keys of this CBT approach. Yeah, which is translatable to all of life, right? That when you teach somebody that skill um, of being able to look at their emotions, it's something that can really serve them. But let's, Dan, for a second for this audience is to describe what we might see in the workplace when somebody's going through this, because it's not always what we'd expect to see. Um, when someone has self-doubt. So can you describe the behaviors that might be happening? Well, it can often manifest in someone whose usual spark and vitality has something gone away, has been extinguished. So somebody who previously had a sense of humor, had a real sense of zeal and interest in what they were doing, who would be part of a team and would contribute ideas and possibilities may have begun to withdraw to retreat into a state of passivity, of listening but not really contributing very much, who might have trouble uh, communicating enthusiasm for ideas, and who plainly is not really enjoying the process in a way they did before. You notice that change. They seem to not quite be present. Those are indicators or they may seem really fatigued. Perhaps their sleep has gotten mucked up. It's one of those common things that gets really impacted by psychological suffering. So they may just have low energy. Noticing the shift, saying this is not the person I knew, being attentive to that, and then being able to have a supportive conversation with that person, not to jump to, we better discipline this person. They're not performing up to par. Time for us to move to some kind of close monitoring, clear expectations, punishment. Before you move to that level, there's another stage, which is the conversation of trust. It's supportive. It's a notice you seem to be going through some difficulty. I don't want to probe into your personal life, but I've noticed you seem to have less energy for the work. And I'm wondering if there's any way we can support you. Is there a way we can be there for you? Yeah. What are some of the common assumptions or judgments that people make uh, on individuals who are struggling with their mental health at work? The assumption can be this person is simply not giving it their all. They have grown lazy or something is going on in their life such that they're not really giving us what we need from them. 
They're not giving what we've come to expect. And basically to join in blaming the person. They're doing enough of that probably themselves. And you're joining in, which reinforces for them the sense that they are, have become inept, uh, no longer giving it, they don't have it anymore. Their sense of failure. So you can feed into, without meaning to, you can feed into that kind of discouraged, despairing loop that is really bad for the person. It's bad for your workplace. It, it's bad on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean- They don't want to go there, yeah. The way you explain it, it just seems so simple. Somebody's behavior changes, ask what's going on so that you can figure it out and understand that we tend to do this um, negative self-talk. We tend to exaggerate our failures and minimize often our successes. Um, but yeah, it's not, it's not always well known uh, for leaders. You know, I, I worked for several decades in the healthcare system. And specifically, I worked in a psychiatric emergency unit at the general hospital. So we were dealing with very extreme situations. Everybody I talked to, was either acutely suicidal or they were psychotic. I was dealing with people in the most horrible and dangerous situations. So we had a staff who worked in a very dedicated way, highly conscientious, really focused on doing what they could against these odds, against these terrible situations. But one thing that was not part of that healthcare culture was recognizing the abilities and efforts of your colleagues giving them praise, supporting them, endorsing what they're doing. Generally it was, you suck it up, you do what has to be done, you deal with the situation and you don't really talk about it, you just deal with it. And to me, that was an unsupportive culture overall for the entire team. It was conducive to people becoming cynical and burnt out, which was bad for the whole team, bad for the morale, bad for their for their ability to achieve results in this situation. You would think in such a tough situation, people would be backing each other up, would be giving each other praise and recognition. And yet that wasn't really the culture. And that is a problematic culture. I haven't been there in the last couple of years in the healthcare system, but from everything I see, from the clients I work with from healthcare, it's gotten rougher. There's more understaffing, the challenges are harder, the whole COVID pandemic situation has made the interaction with patients much more difficult. There's more resentment and blaming. There's a lot to deal with and the culture needs to change. Well, and that lends itself to the conversation that every psychosocial factor can be protective or it can be a risk, right? Depending on, and, and in order to balance out workplaces where there's no choice but to have the risk of being exposed to traumatic situations, if most of your clients are suicidal or, you know, in a really difficult situation, that we need more protective factors than we would in an average workplace where that exposure isn't there. And yet it, what you're describing is it doesn't happen that way. Um, Next year, Dan, my focus is going to be on creating psychological PPE. So it's Francois May too brought that uh, phrase forward. And I'm thinking we need to do a better job of looking at the risks that we're putting employees under, whether they're the grocery store clerk or they are a healthcare worker or they are a librarian where somebody comes in off the street that's aggressive. We need to prepare them for the trauma that they are likely to be exposed to. Can you talk a little bit about, if, if you could, how you would prepare somebody for a job where they're likely to be traumatized? My sense is that every occupational sector has its own psychological risks and its own way of being really difficult. We tend not to think about people who are working at jobs where they compose what I call the infrastructure of our lives. I've done some work with bus drivers. The challenges of being a bus driver are really substantial. 
uh, the kinds of interpersonal interactions you might be facing, the kinds of resentment and anger, not at you, but you as a symbol of a society that may have treated someone in a cruel and negligent way, you become a symbol and then you can become the target for all kinds of really terrible anger and resentment. And for that person who is very skilled at managing this huge vehicle under all kinds of physically dangerous and risky situations, who's now facing this psychological risk and harm, that job requires specialized training in how to protect yourself psychologically and emotionally, how to manage situations, how to be empathic and compassionate for the person you're dealing with, and also self-compassionate for your own situation. So each job to me has its own particular set of psychological dangers, and a strategy needs to be put in place with training and support and peer support and so forth for every job in a way that would keep people psychologically safe doing that work. And it may be a matter of saying, this is how your job is meaningful. This is what you contribute. So if I'm dealing with a transit driver, I say, you know, I take transit. I've been taking it my whole life. I'm on subways and buses and trains and whatever. Uh, I've always done that. And I am so grateful to you. And I love the way in this city, when people leave a bus, they say, thank you. I haven't seen that in other places. What a remarkable tradition seems to have somehow developed in this place. That's lovely. Uh, for every job, whether it's healthcare or it's law or it's medicine, there are psychological risks and they are particular to that kind of work. And a strategy needs to be in place to help people in that occupation stay safe. So there's the, there's the tactical approach, right? Okay, I'm going to tell you that this could happen. I'm going to um, prepare you with processes. But do we prepare them to deal with the rumination, uh, those thoughts that just don't stop with the fact that they're not sleeping, with the emotions that they may have as a result of being exposed to a traumatic incident? And, and if not, how would you do that, Dan? Well, I would have to say first that a lot of research needs to be done on the prevention of traumatic reactions. There's a little bit of research on that. And it's kind of interesting, but it's not widely applied. Generally speaking, the system is designed to do nothing until someone isn't at work one day. And instead, there's a note from their doctor this person has developed post-traumatic stress disorder or depression or is psychologically unable to come to work. So they're not coming in until they're better. And people say, oh my gosh, oh, that's terrible. Then the person goes into the medical system where they'll be given some medication to calm down their emotional suffering. And maybe they'll be put on a wait list and maybe they'll be lucky. And at some point in about three or four months, they'll receive some kind of relevant treatment pretty far down the road. And by that point, it's much harder to treat. And other patterns, what they tend to be do, do is what I used to call television therapy. And maybe it's Netflix therapy now, but go home, here's a pill, take it every day. And otherwise don't do anything. Three months later, we'll check in on you. So this is fairly typically the approach that's taken to workplace psychological injuries. It's really ineffective and it makes it much harder to work with that person. I get referrals of people, but they've been off work often for six months or a year or two years. This is much harder. So this is not the way to do it. There should be a fast intervention. The person should get appropriate evidence-based treatment or intervention or just support doesn't need to be diagnosable if it were picked up long before that when the person had distress and suffering and performance impacts and somebody noticed and spoke to them and said we're going to suggest if you're okay with that that you see a psychologist who works with us who really understands this kind of workplace and we're going to refer you to that person 
I remember being at a conference in Amsterdam and they had passed legislation which said every organization had to have a psychologist on contract who could intervene quickly with their employees. Every organization, every employer had to have this by law. And I thought, that's brilliant. What a good idea. You intervene early, you intervene effectively in an evidence-based way, and you prevent that someone not showing up for work because they now have a diagnosis and they're into this other healthcare system and they're off for six months to a year. You intervene long before that and much more effectively. Peer support systems have some of that quality. You're able to talk to someone who's in the same line of work. You can talk about what you're thinking. They can talk about what was helpful for them, what worked. There's this whole other line of research called self-care that I've been very involved with for the last 15 years, which is the fact that research says that people can learn through workbooks, through online tools, they can learn skills for managing the stresses of their job much more effectively or of their personal life. Some of the skills that have been demonstrated to work as therapy also show not the same level of effect, but a pretty good effect as a self-care module. So I developed 15 years ago, this thing called the Antidepressant Skills Workbook, because I wanted to be able to teach at a population level the CBT skills that I've seen be so effective clinically. And I thought this should be readily available to everybody and it should be available free. So we got funding, we developed the workbook, we designed it to be very user-friendly. We put it up on the website for free download. It's there in English and French and Punjabi and both scripts of Chinese and Vietnamese and Farsi. It's there as an audio book and it's all free. Where do and they find that, Dan? If you just enter the words antidepressant skills workbook on your search engine, you'll get there. You'll get there. And it's not necessary for you to have depression for this workbook to be valuable. Absolutely not. It sees there being a spectrum of psychological distress. There's low mood, there's a real sense of low mood, there's despair, there's diagnosable depression, et cetera. There's a whole spectrum. And if you intervene early when it's sadness, when you're getting demoralized or discouraged and you start applying these methods, it's way more effective than waiting until you have more severe depression. Although even then the research says it's very effective. Even when someone is severely depressed, people have much more capacity for self-change, for better coping than we tend to give them credit for. We tend to think, you know, you've got a diagnosable depression, you're just going to have to rely on Prozac. That's all that can be done. And the research says that's not true. People retain much more competence, much more capacity for changing and doing things differently than you give them credit for. Now, this workbook has been downloaded maybe a million and a half times. Uh, we get 300,000 downloads last year in China. I don't know through what mechanism or in what system, but somehow the word gets out and it spreads and it goes viral. This is something that at a population level, people are finding, they're discovering it around the world and it should be recommended. We did- Well, that's it. When you're yeah. contributing to the greater good to help people help themselves, uh, yeah. it's an amazing thing. Um, Dan, let's go back to psychological health and safety. Um, right. in the workplace and talk a little bit um, about what somebody, uh, a leader, a CEO, whatever, HR, what are they supposed to do with the results that come from Guarding Minds at Work? Okay, so first of all, Guarding Minds at Work, uh, as you know well, is an innovative tool. It's one of the most useful and important tools out there especially for employers who are practical, who want something actionable, who want it to be directly relevant to their organization. They're not researchers. They're not looking to discover what are the underlying patterns of the universe. They wanna know what's going on in my company that's of direct relevance and meaning and impact. So Guarding Minds at Work goes through the factors 
that describe the kind of things organizations can do to mitigate psychological risks. It's again unique because it's not a measure of employee mental health. It's not a measure of stress in the workplace. It's a measure of how well is this organization doing at taking action to protect its workers. And all those factors are actions, which as you say, if the organization is doing really well on say recognition and reward, those employees are being protected and they will be safer. If they're having a low rate uh, rating by employees on another factor, maybe it's workplace balance between work and personal life. And that's really down in the rating of employees. You got a problem and your employees are more, more at risk. But it also says, here's what you can do. That is what I love about the guarding minds at work approach. It directly leads to actions. You see these five things where you've got pretty low evaluations. What can you do to take action on these specific items and factors? What are the actions this leads you to? Which really sets up an organization to say, what can we do? Not just, nope. oh, it's up to the employees, but what can we do to make their lives safer? Yeah. One of the things that you created, and I hope I'm not putting you on the spot because I can't remember everything I ever created, <laughs> but one of the things that you created was a tool to help uh, employers say, well, we have a lot of options on what we could do. How do we make a good decision about where to focus? Do you remember the tool? Well, we have a number of related tools. Uh, one of them is called the Employer's Action Guide to psychological health and safety. And that sets out a framework for identifying actions and putting them into practice and so forth. Uh, we also have a way of using guarding minds at work at the more executive decision-making level to take those results and see what might action look like, what are the possibilities. We have other tools we've created to make that whole process much more feasible. And there's just a number of them. One of them that I really thought was very helpful says, we've got a, we're considering taking action. So we have something called the morph, which again is, is available. You can get it to people free. A uh, measure of organizational readiness for psychological health. And it's a measure of what's called readiness, which says, what is this organization open to? What are employees uh, think, what do they think is helpful? What do they know about what we're already, we're already doing? And you come up with three or four of your key actions, and then you do a survey. And you say, are you aware of this? Do you think this would be helpful? Do you think it's feasible at this time? Does it seem affordable? Does it make sense? So employees, in effect, get to rate or vote upon possible actions. And they, it may be something you think you're very proud of, and you sent out the information about some program through your intranet and so forth. And employees say, never heard of this. Don't know anything about it. Uh, it doesn't seem relevant to me, which can be incredibly helpful feedback to say, oh, we need to communicate differently or better, or we need to change our strategy. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I was thinking about, and you've actually mentioned it in the more, is you just had a list of words that start with A, that is it accessible to everybody? Is it uh, you know, is it based on the evidence? That's not an A, but is it affordable? Right. Is it? And you yeah. had this list and I thought that's just brilliant because it helps with the critical thinking about where do I start? Where do I invest limited time and resources? And it walks them through that. Yeah. Yeah, I would. I, I know the tool you're talking about. No idea what we called it, but I. <laughs> certainly would provide it in a way where people could learn about it and see it and use that approach. We thought a lot about how do you make decisions? How do you identify actions? What would that look like at an organizational level? Sure, we ended up calling everything something with an A, just made it <laughs> at that point easier to remember the model. Yeah. But those are the questions you need to ask. Is this thing actionable? Is it something you can put into practice? Is it affordable? Do we have the resources to actually do this? Is it going to be acceptable to our workers? Is it user friendly enough? Does it make sense to them? A set of questions like that that help you to say, what's a high quality action? 
what's an action that may look good in principle, but I don't think it's relevant in our organization. Yeah, and, and not the best choice. Question. Yeah, absolutely. Very helpful. Um, in terms of where you see psychological health and safety evolving um, in the years to come, can you speak a bit about that? At one point in developing the Guardian Minds at Work tool, uh, we had a focus group and we got some leaders in occupational health and safety. And I was chatting with someone who was just about to retire as head of research for the compensation board, workers' compensation board, very smart person. And he said, listen, I've been working in physical health and safety through my career. And we've still got a long way to go. So don't think that it's all going to change in the next five years. It's a long path. Physical health and safety has been in development for 100 years. It started with the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in New York City. And there was a, a garment manufacturing center where all the exits were locked so nobody could go out in the wrong time. And there was a fire. And you had young immigrant women jumping out of the windows. You had a number of deaths. And the whole United States took notice. And they said, we have to do something about this. And for the first time, there was legislation that said employers are responsible for the physical health and the safety of their workers. This was a radical notion. And suddenly there was legislation that said, you have to, it's not optional. You do not lock the exit doors, etc." It changed so much, but it's been a gradual process of identifying what does it mean to protect the physical safety of the workforce. What makes me laugh in a way, it's kind of interesting. My middle name is Elliot. Why did my mother give me the name Elliot? Well, there was a young lawyer named Pierre Elliot Trudeau in Quebec where I grew up. And he was fighting for the asbestos miners in Quebec who were developing these terrible lung diseases. And he fought heroically for them. So there would be legislation saying, this cannot just continue. They must be protected. So my mother said, I'm gonna give you the name Elliot because that's the kind of activism I honor. And I thought, I like that story. Mm -hmm. But that's the history of physical health and safety. And it's been a long path and a long struggle and it's very much still underway. Now but we're talking psychological- come a long way. And we have. There's yeah. been a lot of growth and a lot of development and workers are a lot safer than they were back then. There's a way to go, but boy, there's been a lot of conscious development. There's been a lot of awareness. It's much more a part of work cultures than it used to be. We'd like to do the same thing for psychological health and psychological safety. So tell us how. Well, to some extent, we're using the existing mechanisms, OHNS committees, <clears throat> union and management, joint participation in OHNS committees has been focused on physical risk, starting to be asking questions about psychological risk, psychological safety. What can the organization do to mitigate psychological risks? How, what does that look like? And those questions are starting to be asked. Organizations and unions are starting to say, what should we expect? What's reasonable here? What's feasible? If we're negotiating, what's actually worth negotiating for and what's feasible to get? If organizations say, well, that's just not feasible, how do we argue back? What's the data here? Another one of those is what are called organizational safety standards. The International Standards Organization has been around for quite a while. It's been entirely physical risk focused until recent years. And suddenly we have groups like that saying, what does this look like in the psychological domain? About six or seven years ago, I was invited to address the International Labor Organization on this topic. It was nice, they flew me to Geneva. I was very happy. It's a city I didn't know, had a good time exploring. But I got to address this assembly of labor organization representatives from around the world. 
And we talked about that whole issue of psychological risk and what it looks like. It was an awareness building exercise. So building psychological safety into international safety standards reached its, its pinnacle, I think, here in Canada with the development of the National Standard for Psychological Health and Safety in the workplace. This was developed uh, with a number of groups working together. It was a huge collaborative enterprise. And now we have this voluntary standard, but it stands out there and it sends the message to organizations, you need to pay attention to this. This is a norm. It's a cultural norm across the Canadian workplace. You all need to have a look at this standard and see how your workplace stacks up in relation to the standard. Do you have these processes in place? Are you aware of these issues? That was quite a dramatic shift and it made Canada one of the world's leaders in this field. Now the challenge is, how do we turn that into practical action? What do we do with that? That's where the Guarding Minds at Work survey comes in, which provides a practical tool. I talked about the Employer's Action Guide. There are other tools. And one you've been associated with, Workplace Strategies for Mental Health, is brilliant because it's entirely actionable, practical. It's not just for researchers. It's not just for organizational consultants. It's for employers and it's for workers. And it lays out a whole range of things you can do that would be helpful. That's a beautiful example of taking this knowledge, this new awareness, and presenting it in a form that is understandable, that's user-friendly, that's actionable, that's feasible. And free, don't forget free. <laughs> I, re I remember, Dan, this is when you were just starting on Guarding Minds, so this would be like 2008, maybe? And uh, Mike Schwartz said, we need to take away all the excuses for not having uh, a psychologically safe workplace. We take away the cost, we take away the development time, we take away the expertise, and we give all that to organizations and then say, okay, now why are you not doing it? Exactly uh, right. I think it's really a powerful message. This thing is so important that it supersedes the natural cultural impulse, which is, are you making profit? Who's making money? Or that other use, that little truism you used to hear, if people don't pay for it, they don't value it. Mm. Well, that was always nonsense. No, no one ever actually demonstrated that or proved that it was true. They just said it because it sounded pretty good and it meant that somebody could make a profit from it, which, et, et cetera. In this case, we're saying this is so important so valuable that we're not going to bother charging for it. This should get out there. Yeah, that it is for the greater good, just like the tools that you created. It's really trying to make a positive difference in the world. Um, believe it or not, we're coming up to the uh, end of the podcast, but I want to save some time in case there's other bits of wisdom um, from you that you want to share with this audience. Well, my overall sense, and this is based both on the <clears throat> research consulting we've done and on my clinical practice, that people have much more capacity for living their lives more psychologically safe ways, for changing the way they cope with situations in a way that both makes them more competent, have more to deliver, and just be more happy. <laughs> Uh, the human capacity for happiness is often underestimated and is underutilized. And people get into a trap where they think, if I just double my income, I would be twice as happy. Tons of research, lots of experiences say that's not true. And I've worked with people who are pretty darn prosperous, but somebody down the street who's earning more and has a nicer house. And they think, oh, if I had that house, I'd be so happy. And often the issue is saying, it's really not gonna get you significantly more happiness. The research says, once you have a basic income and you have food and shelter and reasonable security, that's about as much happiness contribution as you get. Beyond that, it doesn't add very much. And then it's a matter of how are your relationships? How's the sense of meaning in your life? 
How's your physical health? How's the balance between your personal and your work life? How are your social connections and friendships? How are those going? What's the state of your spirituality? Those turn out to be the factors that give the most to your sense of meaning and satisfaction and joy and happiness and psychological safety in your life. Again, there's much more capacity. And if we give people the skills and the opportunities to build what happiness creating skills, then we're really going to increase what they, what they call in Bhutan gross national happiness. And it's way more interesting, I believe, than gross national prosperity. Yeah, yeah, because ultimately, isn't that all that prosperity is about, is a way to support happiness. And if we just went straight to the end goal, instead of uh, focusing on the money, we might do a whole lot better. Um, Dan, I want to ask you a question, and I know for sure that you know the technical answer. But I want you to describe what a psychologically healthy and safe workplace would look like, would feel like to somebody who has no understanding of the concept. Okay. Well, uh, looking through Guardian Minds of Work is a nice way to start to see what the aspects or the features are of a psychologically safe workplace. For example, it's one where you get recognized for the work you put in, for the risks you take, for what you do in that workplace, your effort, your ability, your accomplishments are recognized, are acknowledged by your team, by your leader. Another one is you feel psychologically supported. So if you're working on a team, the team support each other. They have your back, they're there for each other. It's not one where you're being say targeted, what's called mobbing, which is more common even than bullying. It's one where you, you have a leader who sees what you're doing, who gives you reasonable tasks to do, and who doesn't attack you. Uh, your leader is not abrasive, because abrasive leadership is very problematic and very risky. And it's interesting, people I've worked with, and it's not that they're bad, rotten people, but I think they have been experienced as bullies because they don't know how to lead teams. I've seen people with brilliant technical skills who then get promoted to lead a team who don't know how to lead a team. They've never been trained in that. I've worked with scientists and IT experts and lawyers who are brilliant at their job, but they don't know how to run a team of other people in a compassionate, kind, and supportive manner. Giving them that training, enhancing those skills would make a workplace much psychologically safer. Yeah. So, so those are the kind of factors that protect people better, that don't expose you to undue psychological risks. Yeah, really well said, Dan. Thank you for that. But now you brought up mobbing. So I need to ask you to explain it to people who haven't heard that term before. Many haven't heard it, but most have experienced it in some form or seen it happening, which is when you're as part of a group or a team and the team turns on someone. They scapegoat somebody. They decide this person is not okay. They're not nice enough. They're not cool enough, whatever it might be. And sometimes it's based on some characteristic, language, immigration status, race, whatever. And they target or gender. And they say, I'm, we're gonna target. They may not make it explicit, but they essentially join together to target this person. And that's a kind of psychological torture. And it's immensely destructive and it's awful. Many of us have encountered it in school where people mob on, they turn on someone and say, you're out. You're not in the group. You're not part of the group. You're not mm -hmm. okay. That could be devastating and can have effects that last for a lifetime. In general, thing that kind of, sorry, yeah. No, I'm just saying, Dan, that when we've dealt with situations of mobbing, we often find that the participants don't recognize it. They say, well, we didn't think they wanted to come for lunch or, you know, they just say things. And so we roll our eyes or they think they're very minor approaches, not um, mobbing like uh, being, you know, intentionally harmful. Yeah. 
And yeah. these subtle little things can be just as damaging. We're sensitive beings and we can take an external situation and we can amplify it within our own minds, but no one ever hears it. No one hears our thoughts. And that's why in therapy, it still can be startling when I say, okay, in that situation, what were you thinking? And the person will say, I thought this just really proved what a loser I am, how useless I am, a waste of space. And I think, wow, that is incredibly intense. And you've never told anyone that. Look at what can go on in your own mind that can be so powerful that no one else would have, and outside you can maintain your composure. And inside it can be brutal. And I think we'll leave it on that note because we all need to think about that, that we don't know what other people are going through. We don't know what they're experiencing or thinking. And so a lot of our judgments and, and assumptions about people are often wrong. Uh, Dan, it was a pleasure. Thank you for all your words of wisdom for everything that you've shared today. Um, this will end up on the psychhealthandsafetycanada.com website. And it will also be on the Flourish DX uh, YouTube website mm -hmm. so that you can see it as video. And when it's um, ready, I will tag you in LinkedIn. So you'll know because they're going to take the most brilliant things that you said. So that's going to be hard. And uh, put <laughs> It'll be them a three in... minute presentation, right? Okay. <laughs> they'll put those up as uh, on LinkedIn. So thanks a lot, right. Dan. Take Thank care. You for doing this. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you.